Last week I jumped the gun for the children's sermon and um, Linnea leaned over to me a few minutes ago and said, I don't think there are any children here, so you jump right on in this time. She's just really messing with me here. <clears throat> Somebody this morning said, well, we we're surprised. We didn't think you'd stick around for the whole week. And <laughs> well, what do you know that I don't know? You know? <laughs> Though I must say, last, yesterday Sharon and I went to the store and bought some vegetables to plant in the yard. So we'll at least be around long enough for them to grow. And bought some herbs, some annuals, and we bought some perennials. So um, hopefully that's a good sign of, of, of a good and long relationship that we have. Today I'm beginning a series, and uh, Chenda will be tying into this when she preaches as well. And it really follows last week's scripture, uh, the whole idea of when Jesus was feeding the 5,000 and there were all these people to be fed and all they had was this measly little gift of a few fish and loaves of bread and there was no way this little bit could feed so many. And Jesus said, here, give it to me. And he gave thanks. And it was in the giving of thanks that the miracle began and the food fed everyone so that they had their fill. Today, I'm going to follow up on that with a series, Who is Jesus in His Own Words? Who is Jesus in His Own Words? And the clue that I, we are looking for is in John's Gospel, whenever Jesus begins a phrase with, I am. I am. I am the bread of life, which is what we will cover today. This whole sixth chapter of John that Shannon read a few moments ago is about bread. It begins with that feeding of all those people with bread and loaves of fish. And then the disciples were so amazed at this experience, they wanted to know more. And so they began having this conversation with Jesus. Tell us about this bread. Where does this bread come from? What is this bread like? How can we have this bread? How can we have this bread all the time? And Jesus keeps saying, no, the bread I'm talking about is different. The bread I'm talking about is like the manna that fell from the skies upon the Israelites when they were traveling through the wilderness those 40 years between their time of captivity in Egypt and their time of liberation in Canaan. Every night the manna would fall upon the ground and when they got up they would harvest it and it would only be enough for that day. Not too much, not too little. It was enough to meet their needs. And Jesus is saying, I am that bread. I am the one who comes and fills you like the manna. I come to give you exactly what you need. And the people, they can't think of what they need. They think of what they want. And they love bread and they want to be fed and their stomachs are growling. No, but we want the bread that you shared yesterday. We don't ever want to go hungry again. Please, just stop talking up here. Give us the bread. Show us the money, in other words. And Jesus goes on and says, no, I can't do that because what I'm offering you is more intangible. It's more spiritual. Even the manna that you thought Moses gave the people, that came from God. That wasn't anything any one person did. And that's what I'm offering as well. A type of food that will fill you up and you will never go hungry again. You could eat until as long as the day is long and you'll still eventually die someday. But what I'm going to give you, the food that I give, will see you through to eternal life. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Now, now some commentators look at this and they say, that what he's really talking about when he says he's the bread of life and because he mentions manna in this encounter that for Jews manna is often related to the word of God it's the word of God that that comes from God that sustains us and feeds us and nourishes us that that's probably what Jesus was meaning that he as him as the bread of life is God's word, and in fact, he is God in the flesh, that he comes to this earth. 
and that in knowing Jesus, we know God, and, and Jesus feeds us in that way with a type of food so that we will never go hungry. Martin Luther King Jr. once preached a sermon on this scripture, and he says that the church possesses three loaves of bread, loaves of bread of, of, of faith, hope, and love. A, a faith that is extraordinary, a faith that is contagious, hope that gives people the courage to live another day, and a love that is extravagant, a love that goes beyond what is just simple or expected. In, the, um, in one of our general conferences back in 2008, one of our bishops preached on this scripture, Bishop Ernest Light, and he said this about this. He says that, Wake up, church. Get up, church. When men, women, and children knock on the doors of the church, they are looking for fresh bread. They want to encounter a vibrant faith. They want to embrace hope for tomorrow. They want to experience extravagant love that includes them. He's talking about this manna from heaven. Jesus as the bread of life is a gift that continues to give. It gives in the way of faith and of hope and of love. But I don't think the bishop goes far enough because he talks about the church having this available when people knock on the doors. And I firmly believe we need to throw the doors open and let the world know we have this. And this is not ours, this is God's, and we don't possess it, we share it. And the only way it really grows is if we share it. I have not yet experienced the community assistance that we're gonna have on July 20th, if I'm not mistaken, the third Saturday. But that's an example of Mount Olivet throwing open the doors. It's not enough just to say, if you really need it, come knock on our door and we'll let you in and we'll give it to you, no. We throw the doors open and we say to everybody, this is going on, come on and bring your friends. We're gonna feed you, we're gonna have time together. We're gonna have many hours together. That's sharing Jesus as the bread of life. This past Easter on a lark, well, we had several weeks to plan for it. We gave every worshiper in my congregation $5 on Easter Sunday. Hundreds of people, we gave everybody $5. If only half as many showed up, we could have given them $10. But hey, who's complaining? And I, and I said to them, this money is an investment. I want you to do two things. I want you to invest it and grow it. Grow this $5. Make $10. Make $20. Make $50. Make $100. Just grow it. And the second thing, invest in this community. You know what they did? They did some of the most incredible things. I had no idea what they would do. Several of them decided they were going to get together on Friday nights, one Friday night a month, and they would pool their resources, and they would go to a local laundromat, and they would offer to do people's laundry. They paid for the laundry, they did the laundry, they played with the children who were there because so many of the people there didn't have homes and they, they had small apartments or they didn't have ways really to look after themselves. And this became their ministry. And others in the congregation and the community began to hear about this and they began sending them money. And now they've got hundreds of dollars because of this. Somebody else works with the Virginia Home. The Virginia Home is a place in Richmond. It's a residential facility for disabled adults. They get dental care from surrounding dentists, except on holiday periods, especially around Christmas. They needed several thousand dollars to pay for a dentist and to arrange transportation so that the residents could get dental care during that time. This person had the idea, she began to invest it, she began to sell it, she raised the thousands of dollars within a few weeks to be able to do that. That's what it means when Jesus is the bread of life. This past Wednesday, I went out to Winchester with um, JP, the Jeremiah Project. And I had a wonderful time visiting with our middle schoolers and talking with them about what it was like. And for those who had been before, 
you know, they knew all the stories, they knew the ins and outs, they knew what to expect. But the first timers, one of them came up to me and said, this was the best week of my life. This is by far the best week of my life. And I said, why is that? And he said, because I came here, I didn't feel very good about myself, but I came here and I didn't even know what I could offer. But I dig holes for posts and I can paint with a paintbrush and I can build a ramp. And even when we're not working or when we're working, the people who live there, they come out and we just visit and we have time with each other. And I realized all these other people in the middle school group, and I feel so small compared to them, but I can do the exact same thing they can do, and I can give as much as they can give. This is the best week of my life. Here is somebody who gets it, who gets what it means for Jesus to be, to be the life, the bread of life. It's, it's, it's to... It's to let Jesus live in you in such a way that you live it out in your own service toward others. And in doing for others, in serving others, in praying with and for others, you in turn are fed back by God in a very deep and a very real way. That's how God's grace works. The more you give it away, the more you get back. The more you give, the more you receive. If you really want to have the best week of your life, it's not getting, it's giving. It's giving. Jesus Christ, I'm giving to you. This is the body of Christ. This is the body of Christ. Thank you.